I don't think folks who haven't gone through this process realize how much time it takes to put together a competitive grant proposal. Um, I am a pretty unlikely person to moderate this, mainly because I've lost almost every grant that I've applied for. <laughs> I've applied for about a dozen. Um, let's see. A dozen grants as a PI, co-PI, or other partner in some way, shape, or form with six different individuals or organizations thereabouts. Um, I got one from the Lauren John Arnold Foundation. They graciously support our MTSS um, work, but it's not a partnership grant. Um, and I'm batting, you know, zero with IES, which I'm sure is uh, something some of you in the audience can relate to. Um, there are have two IES grants in the hopper, so fingers crossed. We'll see what happens. Um, but right now, in order to talk more about uh, grant development, grant pursuance, and, and other ideas around partnership grants, I want to invite up uh, Beth Cassidy, Angel Harris, Katrina Miller, Steve Porter, and Angie Wright. So please give them a round of applause. First thing I'd like to do is starting with Katrina on the far left. Please just introduce yourself and make mention of a grant that you applied for, uh, succeeded with, and are particularly proud of. Okay, I feel bad going first on that one. My name is Katrina Miller. I work at the SAS Institute. Um, I've been there since June. Um, I'm based in Tennessee, however, and so the experience that I want to talk to you about today is my work at the Tennessee Higher Education Commission and the Council of Chief State School Officers. In Tennessee, I oversaw grant applications for all the Title II grants um, and did that for about five years. But the grant that I wrote and was successful was Tennessee's Race to the Top Grant. I'm Angel Harris. I'm a professor of sociology at Duke University. And uh, the grant that I will talk about is Javis. It's called the um, Javis Funded by the Department of Education, and it's a collaboration with Wake County. Hi, I'm Angie Wright. I'm the Senior Director for the Office of Grants and Strategic Advancement with Wake County Schools. I uh, worked with Dr. Harris on preparing the Javits proposal, so we'll uh, have some conversation about that. Um, so in terms of grants, uh, most proud of and successful with um, have been one of our recent Magnet School Assistance Program grants. Uh, Steve Porter, I'm a professor here in the College of Education, and like you, I've had many failed IEF proposals, and I finally had a successful one. I uh, am working on a grant with two folks from uh, uh, Friday Institute, Sarah uh, is one of them, and working with DPI as well together to evaluate the state's uh, Read to Achieve third grade reading uh, retention program. <coughs> Excuse me, my name is Beth Cassidy. I'm Director of Research Development for the College of Ed here at NC State. Um, full disclosure, I've actually never written a grant proposal. So, <laughs> so uh, my, um, my uh, experience is really uh, steeped in the uh, practicalities and the logistics of getting proposals out the door and, and working with partnerships with schools and, and others. Um, and um, I think that's it. We, we, oh, I did want to say um, we consider a 25% hit rate very good for proposals, so you're not doing too bad. I'm under 10%. Uh, you're, 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 there's room for improvement. Thank you. Well, I, I want to uh, situate this um, through the lens of partnership grants only. I know many of you have probably been involved in individual grant writing where you've used some kind of extant data or existing data set uh, in order to pursue a project individually, but I think what is of most interest and in the spirit of this, this forum is to uh, talk about partnership grants and the different roles that um, you as a university a scholar or an LEA representative or working in some other capacity like uh, through THEC could provide insights about uh, what goes into a partnership grant. So I'm just going to open it up to Annie and all five of you. Um, how, when, how do you approach either an LEA or if you're an LEA, how do you approach a university partner um, in pursuing a grant opportunity? Well, um, I think the important thing is to uh, have a, a sense of, well, you obviously have to know what you want to do in your, in your research topic, but also you have to uh, remember what is important to the partner that you want to uh, collaborate with, right? And so um, oftentimes as researchers, 
uh, we're all we're, we're thinking about what we want in our data, what we want to collect, and, and what studies we're going to be able to do uh, with, with the data that's collected from this grant. Uh, but it's important also to realize that the, the partner has a may have a different set of goals that they're trying to optimize on, and so the important thing is to try to um, really get a sense for uh, uh, what the partner wants and how to make that work. I mean, that sounds obvious, but it's, it's easier said than done. It's not always the easiest thing to, to, to navigate uh, because in, in academia, you know, there are different things that are incentivized, right? And so there are different incentive structures and it, it's trying to make those things work together that, that can be challenging sometimes. If I could add to that, I think having the opportunity for um, really intentionally building partnerships between school districts and higher ed partners is, is critically important. And actually doing that before the grant opportunity comes along, uh, those of us who are involved in grant writing know what the quick turnaround time often is that's associated with grant proposals. And so if you don't already have a basis for a relationship and have some understanding of the interest for your higher ed partner and the higher ed partner, having understanding of what the interest might be for the school district, then you oftentimes, at the onset of development of a grant application, you're spending time getting to know each other, getting to know what the priorities are, and, and that can make for challenges in developing your grant proposal. And, and I'll add to that as well. One of the things that we often saw um, in the Title II grants, which were the Improving Teacher Quality Grants focused on professional development for teachers, um, was the university partners were always the, um, the primary investigator, the ones applying for the grant. And it was obvious to us as um, readers who had a true partnership and who just went to the district and said, can we provide this PD? It'll be no cost to you. Signed this letter, saw the same letter from the districts they were involved with. Um, and oftentimes they would use, we required them to use and do a needs assessment. They would use state level data and say this school is really bad, um, <clears throat> their achievement's really low, and, and we need to improve it, and this is how we're going to do it. But it was obvious that it was not linked into the district's priorities of where they felt they really needed help and were really focused on that year. So linking in with the district and, and having a listening partnership um, is something that we often emphasize, that you're listening to the district needs and meeting them where they are. Um, not just after your own agenda or trying to do the same research over and over. Um, I remember we had one faculty member who literally submitted the same proposal for six years and sometimes it would get funded and then other times it would not and she would be like, well, why does it get funded one year and not the next? And I really wanted to say to her, well, we had better reviewers this year, the year that it didn't get funded, <laughs> but I couldn't because I worked with the state. Um, so what we did is we talked to her and we brokered a meeting with her in the school district and um, allowed them to tell her what they needed and why it was kind of a little off base. Um, and it created a really great partnership for them um, at the university um, in placing their future teachers as well as with the school district. Just wanted to add that um, it was interesting to see the quote earlier from the Department of Ed uh, IES person who was saying that you know, better research comes out of true partnerships um, and at the IES, they have had this surge of uh, programs that really do emphasize partnership that they did not have before. Um, and I think that's one of the keys to our starting to have some success, um, is that it, you know, the partnership opportunity um, does make for stronger research, and, and that's what we can um, propose as opposed to just their standard education research programs that they had for years. And I think uh, we have a pretty diverse audience here of both <coughs> practitioners and scholars, and I wonder how, when you're approaching a grant opportunity, you identify roles. Um, LEA staff have certain strengths, university staff have certain strengths. How do you negotiate who does what and what the expectations are for any particular grant application? Well, I, I think that's um, probably one of the most important things that, that go along with uh, grants that you know, when, when there's a partnership involved. First thing is you have to um, put your ego aside. I mean, one of the things as a researcher, uh, with every study that I've ever conducted, I analyze my own data. Always, always been that way. Uh, and uh, in collaboration with Wake, uh, they have a strong uh, uh, data analysis team, a strong research team. Uh, 
uh, stronger than what I anticipated. Uh, and in fact, so, you know, their, their, their analytic skills are, are really good. Um, and because of that, uh, it was, you know, it was, I realized that the role was they felt comfortable doing the data analysis. They felt comfortable um, owning the data and really um, manipulating the data. And, and my sense was that that's how they wanted to proceed. And I said, okay. You know, I had to, I had to, I had to take that position of being okay with it, right? Um, but, but it was easy because I could, I could see they know what they're doing, right? So it was easy to do that. But that's one of the things is you have to, um, be able to, you have to be willing to give up certain roles uh, that, that, that you may have in some contexts, uh, and, and you have to be willing to delegate, and that's not always easy, particularly for academics who are, you know, it, in academia, it's, it's a very individual process, right? You, 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 you get rejected, you feel that it's all you, uh, and in this context, you have to really, um, you have to really be able to delegate, um, and, and that's not always easy. I think it also depends on the, the project. I think for some academic researchers, it's important to realize that uh, the people you're partnering with, the, the grant may not be that important as it is important to you. And uh, they actually have full-time jobs, unlike faculty, uh, and may have limited time to work on proposals. So with us, uh, we team up with DPI. We end up doing, I guess, most of the preliminary data analysis, I believe, Sarah. Uh, and they helped us a lot with understanding the data, understanding the program, and so forth. But I think we ended up writing a big chunk of the, the proposal ourselves. Uh, and a part of that just sort of the reality that, you know, we have the time to sit down and, and crank out. What is it like? we're, we're lucky, it's only 15 pages in a single space. Uh, and many LEAs, the folks just don't have the time to, uh, to sit down and do that kind of work. Yeah. Even though one of the biggest challenges is reducing the number of pages, because you've already gone over, right? <laughs> Who is the agency partner for your IES grant? DPI. It is DPI. Okay. So, I, and I would say, I, building on um, Judge Porter's comments, I think it's going to vary from grant program to grant program. And you have to look at the particular grant program to determine who's going to be the most competitive applicant. Uh, in many cases, when we're partnering with an institution of higher ed, it's going to be the higher ed. And um, they're, they're more likely, their funders going to be more likely to respond positively to the application coming from the institution of higher ed who has a long standing track record of conducting rigorous research and um, working in partnership with school districts. So I think first it is determining who's going to be the most competitive applicant. And then if, uh, if it's going to be your higher ed partner, then some deference to your higher ed partner and, and how they like to typically structure development of a grant application. Um, and, and be willing to be flexible and negotiate with one another. I think that's, again, by having relationships that are already developed beforehand. I know uh, for myself, uh, because I do work with so many of the institutions that are in this room today, I have relationships with like Beth Cassidy, for example, at NC State. And so we're keeping in constant communication with one another throughout the year, well in advance before grant programs come up. So we're having some of these conversations on the front end. So when the grant comes out, we've already worked through some of the logistical items about how we're going to coordinate and organize the work. So I have a really practical piece of advice that I saw one university do in Tennessee that was really effective. Um, they actually took some money, um, rearranged some cost structures, and had a dedicated person to grant writing. Um, and this person wasn't your typical um, like HR or IR person in the university. It was more of a project manager. Um, and they organized everything. They organized all the responses for every grant for all the faculty, all of the LEA responses, and they were politically protected, which is important. So there wasn't a faculty member who had tenure who could say, you know, I don't like that person because they could tell them no. So they were able to really get in there and say, that's not what's best for the university or for the grant and help make those decisions. And their word was sort of final because it was a logistical question. It wasn't a content question. Um, and that made their grants really powerful. They went from barely winning any um, year after year to getting every um, proposal funded with a limit of six each year after that just because of that one logistical change and having a really strong project manager. 
just want to add that um, you know should acknowledge that there are this can be tough deciding who does what um, you know working on a proposal somebody does a lot more work than the other I think between school systems and um, the universities it is a little more clear than sometimes just within our university there, there's some some rough patches we hit as we get the proposal out the door but again long-term relationships that have been built before really help that and, and who typically approaches whom? Is it universities who approach uh, agency staff, or is it agency staff who approach universities, or does it just happen differently uh, depending on the circumstance? I would say in my experience it has been, it varies from grant program to grant program. Um, certainly there are some as a district that we, uh, grant programs that we may have more interest in than others. They're related to a focus of practice, uh, building on the language from the last session, um, and are more directly connected to our strategic plan and priorities of our district. And so in some instances, um, we could go it alone as a school district and apply for the grant program. In some cases, we do need a partner. And in some cases, our application would just be strengthened if we had a partner. And so I think really looking at the grant opportunities when we, we are reaching out to a higher ed partner, keeping that notion of mutualism in mind, and that when we reach out to a higher ed partner, that um, it's not just about meeting a district need, but we know that it's also meeting a need for our higher ed partner as well. So again, that relationship piece, and I'm, I know I'm kind of harping on this, but um, having some awareness of what some of the areas of research interest are for our higher ed partners, and finding where those natural points of cohesion are between the practitioner and the district's needs and the interest of our higher ed partner are critically important. Yeah, and I agree, it's, it's been both ways. Uh, I think we reached out to DPI, and in fact we were building on uh, a failed research practitioner partnership proposal to look at read to achieve from two years prior, but then I'm a uh, lead evaluator on a first in the world project, which is uh, kind of a higher ed version of race the top, kind of a limited version. And uh, there the university reached out to RTI International and said, we, we want to apply for this grant and we need help with the, uh, the evaluation. So I think it really depends. I think um, one thing that might be on some folks' mind is the uh, Ever Student Succeeds Act and the new evidence uh, provisions that are included in the in the in the act, and so you know, I know that we've talked about this in Wake County in pursuing uh, subsequent rounds of magnet school assistance program grants. Um, how do you think about those new provisions? How will it change the way that you write your grant applications? And are, are you finding yourselves having to go farther afield to find tier one evidence in order to support your proposals? So um, I'll speak on, on behalf of the school district, um, and, and ESSA, of course, is, is most directly impacting K-12, uh, but I will say um, we're actually working in partnership with NC State right now on a grant, and we're starting to see some of the same creep that I think um, showed in ESSA with now requirements for evidence of promise. Um, the U.S. Department of Education recently put out some non-regulatory guidance regarding educational investments and how the department is going to make future decisions around educational investments. And it's very clear, and, and this of course is stemming from ESSA, um, is that evidence of promise is going to be required now. So research-based best practices are great, but research-based best practices that are really steeped in potentially rigorous research design, at the very least evidence of promise, and I can certainly share um, that non-regulatory guidance with anyone who's interested, but there's different levels of evidence. And um, we're seeing, depending on the grant program, they may require different levels of evidence. So some may be okay with moderate, some may be looking for strong um, evidence of promise in order to be competitive for a grant application. 
Uh, so for us right now, I know a lot of what we are trying to do to prepare as a district, and this is where, again, another great opportunity for us, I think, to partner with higher education is to be able to identify the research that's already out there that would help us be able to meet evidence of promise standards. Um, <coughs> Many of you may be familiar with What Works Clearinghouse. Uh, we sometimes joke that it's not really what works, it's what not works. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is What Works Clearinghouse. But they have recently unveiled uh, a newer, better version of What Works Clearinghouse, and it's supposed to have more research in there that would meet evidence of promise standards. But that's not the only place we can go, and there's probably research out there that working with our higher ed partners who are the experts in these areas, uh, we would have much more that we would be able to rely on than just what's in What Works Clearinghouse. So one place that I could encourage you to look, I, I know this is kind of an emerging area and there's a lot of uncertainty around it just because funding hasn't come through and you know there's a big election next week. Um, that may change some things, but the, the federal centers that have been funded, especially in the special education area through um, the Department of Special Education, I forget the whole name right now, they have a lot of evidence-based stuff that they can provide for you, as well as your regional education labs. They're a really good resource, and they're all free um, because they have been federally funded, so I encourage you to work, reach out to those partners um, and ask them for the research that they've done or that they have access to. Does, is there anyone in the audience who has a particular grant program that they might have in mind? I mentioned a few early, on an earlier slide, but that certainly doesn't capture it all. Um, any graduate students or faculty members who have had success with or have a program they might recommend? Okay, well let us know if you do, <laughs> because we're always searching for the uh, foundation or organization that will not reject us. Um, <laughs> I think that one interesting, uh, in my experience with this Arnold Foundation grant, um, when I was reading through the RFP, one of the big you know, statements that it made loudly and clearly was that this was for evaluation uh, work. But after beginning various conversations with the foundation, I found out that it, they would support implementation work. Um, and so I think for, for practitioners, um, there's this idea that maybe uh, grant supporting implementation is more important than evaluation. And for you know, researchers, maybe a grant supporting evaluation is more important than a grant supporting implementation. So how do you, how do you all think about um, implementation versus or in conjunction with evaluation and the kinds of activities that a grant program might support? From my perspective, it's not that one is more important than the other, just that I <coughs> prefer to do the evaluation than the implementation. Uh, just in terms of my own research interests um, and in terms of, of the work involved. Because IES funds a lot of implementation grants, development grants, but um, that's a big deal. It's a much bigger deal trying to develop uh, some type of intervention over two, three years versus coming in and evaluating uh, how it's been implemented. I think different funding agencies have different things that they focus on. And so um, it really depends on the funder as well. I think that's really important. Um, so there are some foundations that focus on implementation and don't really pay much attention to evaluation of it. Um, and then, uh, uh, then there are others that are really big on some kind of experimental design where you're showing some kind of effect at the end. And so it, it really depends on, on the, the foundation that you're looking at. So it's not one size fits all, you know. I think that's also um, we're having a relationship with the school district, and I think in the case of Wake County, uh, specifically with our data research and accountability team, uh, Matt shared earlier much of the work that um, is handled internally, but other things the district might be what might want to be able to do, and questions the district might want to be able to explore, and um, by partnering with higher education agencies and only expands our capacity to be able to do that kind of work. And so being able to have those really intentional conversations and planning intentionally with um, data research and accountability offices and school districts uh, to find out where those areas are that higher ed might be able to come in and, and be a partner where it's meeting the need for you from the research perspective, but in addition, it's helping the district to achieve some goals that they have and answer some questions that they may have around problems of practice. 
I think from a university perspective, again, it, it is there's a great variety. Um, I think we do more um, implementation uh, with evaluation as part of it, um, and it does sort of. Um, but again, we're we're coming up with these um, things that we think might help, and in, in conversation with the um, the LEAs or the, the or DEI, and then. Um, we have to, again, as you said, look at who will fund us. Um, and our College of Ed at NC State, the National Science Foundation, is our primary funder. Um, and they really do, um, they, they want a lot of uh, new research and implementation and figuring out what's working and then you know, figuring out how to get it out to the broader um, uh, audiences. And what's the role of uh, products and deliverables? Um, I was quite overwhelmed in what I was asked to produce um, for my small grant, which was uh, you know, semi-annual reports, uh, budget documents, uh, an accounting of how time was spent, ensuring that uh, I applied for and, and or submitted and, uh, and, and one placement of, of a paper or a poster at a conference. I mean, there's all these things that are associated with the grant um, that sometimes might suggest that it's, it's more trouble than it's worth. Um, is it more trouble than it's worth, or are these, are these deliverables just part and parcel of the process? So Semi-annual sounds like a, a vacation. <laughs> we have a, a few right now that they are insisting on monthly reports. Yeah, so I, I think um, when you're considering any grant application, that you do have to approach it from some point of a cost-benefit perspective. Um, I, I think I see this probably less at the larger types of grants that we're probably talking about here in this room. We may grumble a little bit about having to do that monthly report, but when you look at the amount of funding that's coming in and what it's going to support you to be able to do, uh, probably in the end, the um, benefits do outweigh the cost. But it is something that you do have to take into consideration. And my experience has been typically when um, the, the collaboration is, is around an area that is meeting a need for the school district, then um, we're willing to be able to work through what some of those costs might be for us in order to be able to participate in the grant program. And so I think getting, getting really clear on what the priorities are, and then if it's something that it's a priority, then again, I think it's easier for us to work through and negotiate and figure out how we're going to address what some of the costs may be uh, for participating. I'm hoping, oh, go ahead. Just to say, I think it's, a, it's, um, it's part of our faculty's expected work is to, um, there's a, you know, a push to do, Grants um, and um, and I think in doing that they also are trying to keep in mind that it's not necessarily part of the LEA's um, work and so they try to, to be respectful and uh, mindful of that that, that it is you know, school systems and others are very very busy and so we need to um, keep that in mind as we do propose and make sure that it is worthwhile to them that we do that work. And I think um, this is a question for all of you. Um, what do you do when the money runs out? You have something up and running for a few years. Maybe it's working great, and you want to continue it. Um, you know, what do you do besides ask for a no-cost extension? I mean, to some degree, you know, that's the same way we in, in academia we have a pipeline of articles of studies that are constantly circulating through the journals. Uh, you know, you have to have something similar in, in, in the grants world where you have a pipeline of grants. And so when, when you're like two years before it ends, you start trying to, um, you know, you're always continuously writing, writing grants and trying to get it funded. I think the important thing to remember is that um, in baseball, three out of ten is very good, right? Uh, in grants world, I would say one out of ten is very good. Uh, it, it's a tough, tough world. Uh, and. I think a lot, the reason why the, the person who you mentioned may, may submit the same grant over and over again is because if you look at everyone, if, when, you, when, you look, when you do a within-person study and you look at everyone's grant, there are a lot of similarities. Most people turn in very similar products over and over again. It's because there's a particular formula, right? And so I, I, for five years, I reviewed grants for NIH, National Institutes of Health. And I remember seeing the grant come, you know, James Jackson in Michigan, this guy, millions and millions of dollars. 
And when I saw it, I said, wow, the craftsmanship was excellent. And I said, this is not his first rodeo, you know? And so, and so it's just incremental changes here and there because the formula's there, the formula works, right? And so this is why you see uh, uh, consistency. The other thing to remember is that once you get in with a funder, it increases your chances of getting funded by them again, right? And so um, it, 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 it's always tough getting that first hit, right? But once you get that hit, it's easier. And a lot of times when you turn into grant and you think it's excellent and, you're, and, and your shotgun is now funded, you have to remember that uh, the people in line before you get first dibs, essentially, right? Those who have been funded before often get an easier read the second time around. And so that's part of it too. It's not fair, but that's just the way it is. Uh, and, and I guess the other thing I would say is one of the things that people look at when it comes to signing roles is um, the strength of the grants team, right? And so um, a lot of times, you know, I'll see a, a, a grant that we're going to submit or something, and I'll say, I don't like the, I don't like our chances. I don't like the chances it's getting funded. The team is not strong, right? Um, and what I mean by that is it has it has nothing to do with your research ability. Nothing to do with that. Um, it always helps to have that gray-haired person on the team who's had many, many grants funded before. That helps, right? Having someone like that on the team helps. Um, and so there are a lot of superficial things like that that are part of the gamesmanship, the craftsmanship of grant writing, right? That increase your chances on the margins, independent of the quality of the actual grant itself. And so understanding those things that that's a part of this, you know, helps you. Uh, deal better with the rejections that come come along. I think the first question that I would ask back to you if you asked me that question about sustainability and what do you do when the funding runs out is, well, did it work? Um, if you didn't meet your objectives, if it didn't change learning, student achievement, if it didn't make progress in our education realm, why would you do it again? So, to quote a professor I had, um, who's crazy but brilliant, um, he used to talk about intelligent fast failure. Do something really intelligent, but let it fail fast if it's not going to work. So stop doing that and do something different. And if it is working, be able to prove it and show it. You need data to back up what you're saying you're doing. Um, when you bring data to the table of all the grant makers that I've worked with, and I've worked with everyone from the federal government to the Gates Foundation to Schusterman and Belk and all those crazy, huge foundations, when you show them that you can make real change and progress based on the data that you have, they're going to give you money. Um, so, if it's working, show them. If it's not, stop. So, so it sounds like a good rule of thumb would be approach a grantor with preliminary data to begin with and not just a big idea? If you have preliminary data of um, what it looks like now and your hypothesis for what it'll look like when you're finished and you can show that and show them the trajectory, yes. Um, we live in a data world. There's a lot of data out there, especially in the education world. Um, North Carolina is data rich, so you have an opportunity to use a ton of information at your fingertips that you historically had. And if you're bringing that to funders, they're listening. Because they want to be able to invest in things that are actually working, and they can only do that in a few states that have the data systems like North Carolina's. So they're going to look at that and say, okay, we can make this investment in North Carolina, know if it's going to work or not, and then implement it in other states if it does work. And so in planning, um, is there a cost benefit to, say, going with a, approaching a large funder for a long-term sustainable project, or maybe choosing a, a group of smaller funders with whom you might have a larger likelihood of winning, but that might also hurt sustainability once the project reaches through fruition? Do you think about going big once versus going small a number of times? I think for me, it's just all about the fit greatest chance of success. Um, when uh, Tripp and Sarah approached me about this IES grant, I was, I was going to say no. I had six bail proposals, and I chaired two different grant review panels for them, so I think I know what I was doing. Yeah. And I said, no, I'm not going to do this. And then they mentioned what it was, and I said, oh, that's a perfect regression discontinuity design. I have a feeling this is going to get funded. Yes, I'll, I'm on board. Uh, and so it was all about fit. I thought, okay, that's a fantastic fit with IES. Um, so to me, it's really about finding out what funders want and trying to figure out who to pitch it to. Yeah. And the benefit of yours is that um, Read to Achieve is going to keep happening. Right? It's, I guess it's state law. It's implemented. Um, they're not, I'm sure the evaluation will hopefully have some bearing on the way the policy proceeds, but right now it's happening. Perhaps. Yeah, perhaps it's happening. Yeah. That, that is a really good point. Um, 
the, the, the best advice I think I can give is to look at whether you're, what you want to do matches the funder's goal. Um, because writing a proposal is hard work. Um, it's hard on everybody, and it takes a lot of time and a lot of angst and a lot of late nights. And you want to make sure it's worth your time. And if you're just spraying proposals around, um, your, your time is wasted. Um, so really focus on the goals and make sure that you are a good match. And I would say, um, building on that, in addition to just thinking about development of the proposal, you also need to be thinking about implementation. I think sometimes in the grant cycle process, it's easy to get really focused on just developing that grant proposal, but then not thinking about all of the measures and all of the logistics that you're going to have to have in place to be able to implement. And if you find that it's a challenge to get everyone on board just to develop the proposal or to get staff time just to work on the proposal, I think you'll find it equally challenging when it kind of comes time for implementation. And that's when you really don't want to be unsuccessful, not because the project failed, the research, you didn't get the answer you were expecting, but because um, of implementation challenges. So I would always encourage everyone to think about beyond the life of the grant, go into it assuming that you're going to receive the funding, then what's the implementation going to look like? One thing about your question around going for small or big money, um, I don't think it really matters. I think if you're wanting like a large pot of money, go for the small money first to get in the door, especially with foundations. And just a note about foundations that I didn't know until like a year ago, which I thought was really interesting. Most program officers have discretionary funds that they can use and can make grants up to $25,000 to even $100,000, depending on the size of the foundation, without having to go to their board. So all you have to do is submit a proposal and they can fund it for you. And then that gets you access to the foundation board when you give reports and you can go for larger money. Um, most of the foundations that I've seen don't do just blanket grant proposals where you submit things. It's about that relationship building where you know that program officer and then they invite you to submit. So as you go to conferences and things, make sure that you're talking to those program officers, seek them out, have lunch with them, and tell them about the cool things that you're doing because they're always looking for new information. Yeah, one, of the, one of the advantages of smaller grants is, uh, remember I said there, there are things on the, on the edges, on the margins that affect when something gets funded independent of, of the quality itself. Um, it's, uh, I'm thinking of a sports analogy, it's a copycat league. Essentially, you get one funder, and now you send a grant off, and you say, oh, it's funded, you know, this part is funded by so-and-so. The grant looks better now, even though it's the same word. It just looks better. And people say, oh, someone funded this already. Uh, let me, let me, uh, it's easier to, to add to the pot than to be the one to start the pot, for some reason, for funders. And so your, your, your batting average goes up if you have additional funders. And so that's why you see those projects where they say, oh, funded by the Spencer Foundation, Kellogg, so-and-so, such and such and such and such. And I'm thinking, wow, you got six funders on this one project, it's amazing. And it's not necessarily that the quality of the grant is, is just amazing, but it, they wrote a good grant and one person funded it and it made it easier to get in the door with the others. And so that's one of the things on the margins that you, know, you have to keep in mind. So that's where the smaller ones can come in handy is kind of getting you off the mat to have some funders behind you so that you can go for the bigger ones. On the, uh, since we're talking about partnership grants, I just want to revisit this uh, idea of roles again. Um, I was struck in reading the William T. Grant Foundation paper on this topic, which again I recommend is excellent. It's an excellent review. Um, they write, most universities are not set up to train researchers to work with school districts. And most school districts do not have the resources or infrastructure to support their teachers, principals, and district leaders in creating new, ro new roles. And so um, for concluding thoughts, I just wanted you to respond to that and maybe provide some insights about how we can bridge that gap between what universities and LEAs or agencies can and cannot do. Um, I think the landscape's changing. So as um, with, with this election coming up and the changes in the Department of Education, the likelihood that they would have a higher education appointed as the new Secretary of Education, um, that's going to play into that. I think that higher education, more so than ever, is going to need K-12, especially around accountability. K-12 has been through this um, for years, and I think higher ed, and my background is higher ed, um, 
we'll have a lot to learn from our K-12 partners, and that will only increase the ability to have really strengthened partnerships because we'll come to the table as equals, and I don't think that we've traditionally done that well. Um, so while we may not agree with all of the changes that may be coming, and um, some are good, some are bad, I think that um, maybe this cross-aisle work can be one of the great things that comes out of it. So I think that the, the challenge varies depending upon where in the university you sit. And so uh, I've never been affiliated with School of Ed. And so for me, I imagine that my challenges are different than someone who isn't in the School of Ed. So I, I imagine that if I were in School of Ed, that there is already an infrastructure and a group of people who say, oh, we've done this before. Here's, here's how you do this, right? For me, it's always the individual reaching out to school district because uh, I've been at schools that don't have schools of ed, Duke and prior to Duke I was at Princeton and so there's no school of ed and so it's, it's an individual who's trying to reach out to, to an institution and so the challenges are, are, are different in the sense that um, uh, school districts, uh, you know, they, they don't know who, who's a sociologist, who is this trying to come study us and so, so, so it, building rapport is more, is more important because there's no infrastructure around me to help me do that and so maybe I am um, uh, overestimating what schools of ed are able to provide in that capacity, uh, but I think that that's that's challenging. And, and and when you do that, you have to come with, with some level of deference to, to the school district and letting them know, look, I you know I I, I want to study this together, uh, you know, expert loosely, you know, I you kind of do that. Um, so I think I'm building building on both of the previous comments, um, I think it's really going back to that concept of mutualism and um, developing relationships so that you can find out what's gonna be mutually beneficial for both partners. Um, we see a lot, I know in, in grants, that um, we're connected with in the district, this notion of collective impact. And that um, the work that we want to achieve can't be achieved in isolation. And so it takes higher education, it takes K-12, working in partnership with one another to address these very challenging issues uh, that face us today in education and uh, where you can build in those structures but it's for the relationship building, having the rapport, networking, making connections, faculty, getting faculty together with K-12 staff so that you can find where those common points of cohesion are for moving forward when grant opportunities and other forms of partnership present themselves. Yeah, I would agree with all that. I was thinking of your point about what advantages we have over you. And I, and I think one of our main advantages is our alumni. We've trained uh, a lot of teachers and principals in Wake and surrounding counties. Um, uh, I think quite a few folks at DPI have gotten doctorates in our colleges. So that's very helpful, I think, for us. We, we just have kind of a synthetic gear when we go out. But, and I would say the Friday Institute is actually a huge asset because they do so much evaluation across the state. I mean, they, they, they seem to know everyone, as far as I can tell. Uh, in the state. So it's a great resource for us in the college of ed. But in the end, it's again, it's the reason it's a resource is because, uh, as you said, the relationships and, and, and getting a sympathetic ear. I think for the for faculty, the, the main thing to keep in mind is that LEAs are, are kind of tired of faculty approaching them for data for their individual research project. And you really kind of have to sell them on what what's the advantage for them. Because someone in their, in their district uh, or their office has to take time out to help you uh, with this project, and so what, what, what will they get out of this? And that's that's what a true partnership is, right? So we have uh, a variety of students working with folks in Wake, and, uh, and the whole idea is that Wake gets some basically some free labor to help analyze data, and the doc students that will be presenting later today, they get this great practical hands-on experience, and that's the kind of thing that I think uh, uh, people need to leverage in the future. And that may lead to a grant one day. Yeah, hopefully we'll see. <laughs> All, right. All right, well, uh, before we take Q&A, can we get a round of applause for our distinguished panel? throw in here. Oh, sure. um, I am the, the infrastructure uh, at, at our College of Ed and um, sure. you know I just wanted to, to, to say that you know the, the larger districts do tend to have a person that, that we can really connect with and, and work with and, and sort of make smooth the, uh, the process along but if you're here from a smaller LEA um, don't hesitate to, um, to jump in with if a researcher comes to you. Um, one of our jobs is to not only help um, our faculty, 
But if we identify a smaller LEA that does not have the infrastructure that the larger ones do, we're going to help them as well and with the process and sort of explain and, and sort of make sure they are comfortable and um, know what the expectations are with getting the proposal out the door. So we're, we're happy to help with that as well, so don't, don't hesitate. Great. Well, there's a mic floating around, um, but if you have any questions, uh, please ask while we have this panel up here. Nobody cares about grant funding? <laughs> Skip. I wanted to um, get a sense of how you build um, rapport and communication among the partners. I'm part of a pretty large IES grant right now, and but some of the partners we've um, we work together, so we've had established relationships, and others are brand new. So how do you work, I guess, more on the interpersonal dynamics and connecting with one another? Well, for us, uh, it, it, uh, my grant with Wake County, uh, we meet once a month. So we meet monthly, and we alternate sites, one month at Wake, one month in, at Duke. And I think that helps, it works, because it, it always keeps us uh, going in the right direction, uh, you know, when you when you have a lot of time between meetings, you know, people, you know, different realities tend to tend to emerge. And so, in our case, doing that really works, uh, really works well. Keep reminding everyone of your shared vision and goals. Um, when there's tension, I feel like that's a way to kind of regroup and recenter that you're doing this for a um, specific reason, and, and generally you're doing it for to advance student learning and make sure that. Our kids are getting what they need, regardless of if it's implementation, evaluation, or um, straight out research. Um, just keep recentering on that. And what does that communication look like? Is it is it memos? Is it emails? Is there a, a strategic planning document that goes along with a grant? I, the way that I've seen it done is when you do have face-to-face -face meetings, I think that's critically important. You read more body language than email languages, and people tend to get swamped with emails. Um, and then when you're in those meetings, when there's points of conflict or points of um, tension, then you go back to, okay, well, this is our ultimate goal, and you keep reminding each other of that. How does this serve that ultimate goal? Um, how does it help us meet it, or is there an alternative? Yeah, because what you write in the proposal isn't necessarily 100% of what's going to happen throughout the life of the grant. Anyone else? Well, I'm in the Office of Professional Development with Wake County, and one of the um, ideas that we have for moving forward is really presenting a lot of um, information to teachers and, and some encouragement to apply for grants, but to do a little bit more hand-holding because it is so intimidating. There is a possibility of getting nothing out of it. They don't have any time in the day. So my role is like a, facil a facilitator is what can I put in front of them that is most likely a to result in something positive for them. Um, so I think my question is, and this might be a silly question, but do I need to think of this as almost writing a grant to get funding to allow them time, or would I be better off just facilitating a process for them? I, I would love your thoughts on that. Sure. And, and I can certainly talk with you more afterwards, um, really specific to our context and weight. Um, I, th I think the types of grants that you're probably going to be looking at, um, it's going to be difficult to find a funder who um, oftentimes recognizes uh, the challenges around time and that you often need time in order to really be able to plan and formulate the kinds of ideas that you would then like to be able to go forward and implement. Um, I think particularly probably um, at the smaller school level or even in the classroom, uh, that's where partnerships like this uh, with our higher education partners, the types of grants that we're often collaborating on, NSF, IES grants, um, there is an appreciation for that, and there's oftentimes uh, ways where we're able to build those kinds of opportunities into grants that would give teachers, uh, now it's not necessarily uh, always uh, release from their full-time duties, but it could be uh, a day of sub-pay 
for a stipend to come and have some professional learning over the summer, working in collaboration with colleagues in higher ed, uh, where they're able to achieve some of those same types of objectives. Um, so certainly, certainly something we could talk about. But this is an exceedingly simple suggestion, um, but you know, writing a grant proposal it is daunting. And it's a different kind of writing than others than other kinds of writing that you do. Um, if you could have like a stable of examples of proposals um, that they could go look at, um, it, I think it would help. I, I, I find that sometimes because it, it's just a, it's a real different animal. Um, so if they can see it, it becomes more clear how to do it, and maybe do it a little more quickly than trying to figure it out on, on your own. So there's a lot of uh, so there's a lot of different potential uh, sources of grants, um, and many of the stakeholders have might have different preferences of the source. So as an individual faculty member, for a variety of reasons, I prefer foundation grants. My university doesn't love foundation grants; they want those U.S. Uh, government grants. Does, do, do LEAs? have a preference uh, as to where um, the funding comes from for, for that sort of partnership or, or what, what the research practice partnership or is that something that's more, they're more open on? Right, um, so, so, so no. Um, there's, uh, I think, a difference for us in um, maybe sometimes what may incent um, wanting to pursue federal funds uh, versus foundation funding. Uh, just to put it out, um, our indirect cost rate is 2.11%. Ours is 51.5. <laughs> 59. <laughs> so in terms of a federal grant versus a foundation grant, uh, if indirect cost is allowable with a foundation grant, um, I think from a financial perspective, for, for an LEA, probably not really a difference. I think it really boils down to the individual grant itself and the flexibilities that maybe surround a particular grant opportunity and maybe some of the requirements that are associated with a grant opportunity. So is it the monthly reports or is it a quarterly report? And again, considering that from a cost benefit perspective, how much is going to be required in order for us to receive the funding? Is it meeting a need for us? And is it really going to be a benefit in the end for us? Looking at all of those kinds of things, I think, are really um, what we do when we're prioritizing grants that we would have interest around, not so much whether it's federal or whether it's corporate or foundation. Going once. Going twice. Again, can we get a round of applause for this panel?